Section one of Amadis of Gaul by Vasco de Libera, translated by Robert Salvi. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amy Graymore. Book one, chapter one and two of Amadis of Gaul. Chapter one, the introduction and beginning of this history. Not many years after the passion of our Redeemer, there was a Christian king in Lesser Britain by the name Gerinter, who, being in the law of truth, was of much devotion in good ways. This king had two daughters by a noble lady, his wife. The eldest was married to Languines, king of Scotland. She was called the Lady of the Garland, because her husband, taking great pleasure to behold her beautiful tresses, would have them covered only with a chaplet of flowers. Agrias and Mabilia were their children, a knight and damsel of whom in this history much mention is made. Elisena, the other daughter, was far more beautiful, and although she had been demanded in marriage by many great princes, yet she would wed with none, but for her solitary and holy life was commonly called the lost devotee, because it was considered that for one of such rank, gifted with such beauty and sought in marriage by so many chiefs, this way of life was not fitting. King Carinta, who was somewhat stricken in years, took delight in hunting. It happened one day that having gone from his town of Alima to the chase, and being separated from his people, as he went along the forest saying his prayers, he saw to the left a brave battle of one knight against two. Soon he had knowledge of the twain, in that they were his own vassals, who, being proud men and of powerful lineage, had often, by their evil customs, offended him. Who the third was he knew not, but now relying so much on the worth of the one, as he feared the two, he drew aside and waited the event, which sorted to such effect, as by the hand of that one the others were both slain. This done, the stranger came towards the king, and seeing him alone, said, "'Gentle sir, what country is this wherein knights errant are thus assailed?' The king replied, "'Marvel not at this knight, for our country yields as others do, both good and bad. As for these men, they have often offended, even against their lord and king, who could do no justice upon them because of their kindred, and also because they harbored in this covered mountain.' "'This king you speak of,' replied the stranger, "'I come to seek him from a far land.' and bring him tidings from a dear friend. If you know where he may be found, I pray ye tell me. The king answered, Befall what may, I shall not fail to speak what is true. I am the king. The knight, then loosing his shield and helmet, gave them to his squire, and went to embrace Garinta, saying that he was King Pedion of Gaul, who had long desired to know him. Greatly were these kings contented that their meeting was in such a manner, and conferring together, they took their way through the wood towards the city, when suddenly a heart ran before them, which had escaped the toils. They followed at full speed, thinking to kill it, but a lion, springing from a thicket before them, seized the heart, and having torn it open with his mighty claws, stood fiercely looking at the kings. "'Fierce as you are,' said King Perion, "'you shall leave us part of that game.' And he took his arms and alighted from his horse, who, being affrighted at the wild beast, would not go near him, and placing his shield before him, went towards the lion, sword in hand. The lion left his prey and came against him. They closed and Perion, at that moment, when he was under the beast and in most danger, thrust his sword into his belly. When Garinta saw him fall, he said within himself, Not without cause is that knight famed to be the best in the world. Meanwhile their train came up, and then was their prey and venison laid on two horses and carried to the city. The queen, being advised of her guest, they found the palace richly adorned and the tables covered. At the highest the king seated themselves, at the other sat the queen with Alisena, her daughter and there were they served, as in the house of such a man beseemed. Then, being in that solace, as that princess was so beautiful, and King Perion on his part equal, in that hour and point they so regarded each other that her great modesty and holy life could not now avail, but that she was taken with great and incurable love. And the king in like manner, though till then his heart had been free, so that during the meal both the one and the other appeared absent in thought. When the tables were removed, the queen would depart to her chamber. Elisena, rising, dropped a ring from her lap, which she had taken off when she washed her hands, and in the confusion of her mind forgotten. She stooped for it, and Perdion, who was near her, stooped down also, so that their hands met, and he, taking her hand, pressed it. She colored deeply, and thanked the king for his service. "'Ah, lady,' said he, "'it shall not be the last, for all my life shall be spent in your service.' She followed her mother, but so disturbed that her sight was dizzy, and now, not able to endure her feelings, 
She went and discovered them to the damsel Darioletta in whom she confided, and with tears from her eyes and from her heart besought her to find out if King Perion loved any other woman. Darioletta, surprised at this alteration, pitied and comforted her mistress, and went to King Perion's chamber. She found his squire at the door with the king's garments, which he was about to give him. Friend, said she, go you about your other affairs, for I must wait upon your master. The squire, thinking it was the custom of the country, gave her the garments and went away. She then entered the chamber where the king was in bed. He who had seen her converse with Alisena confidently now hoped that she might bring some remedy to his passion, and said to her all in trembling, Fair friend, what demand ye? I bring you wherewith to clothe yourself, she replied. That should be for my heart, said Perion, which is now stripped and naked of all my joy. As how? said the damsel. Thus, quoth he, coming into this land with entire liberty, and apprehending nothing but the chance of arms, here in this house I have been wounded by a mortal wound, for which if you, fair damsel, can procure me remedy, you shall be well recompensed. He then charged her not to discover him but where it was requisite, and told her his love for Elisena. Then said Darioletta, My lord, promise me on the faith of a king and a knight that you will take to wife my lady Elisena, when time shall serve, and right soon will I bring ye, where not only your heart shall be satisfied, but hers also who, it may be, is in as much or more thought and dollar than you, with the same wound. But without this promise you shall never win her. The king, whose will was already disposed by God, that that which ensued might come to pass, took his sword which was by him, and laying his right hand upon the cross of its hilt, pronounced these words, I swear by this cross, and this sword, wherewith I received the order of knighthood, to perform whatever you shall require for the lady Elisena. Be you then of good cheer, said she, for I also will effect my promise. Darioletta returned to the princess and told her how she had sped. You know, said she, that in the chamber where King Perion lodgeth there is a door opening to the garden, whence your father used to go out, and which at this present is covered with the hangings. But I have the key thereof, and we can go in at night when all in the palace are at rest. When Elisena heard this, she was highly contented. But recollecting herself, she replied, how shall this be brought to pass, seeing that my father will lodge in the chamber with King Perion? Be that to me, said the damsel, and with that they parted. When it was night, Darioletta drew aside the squire of Perion and asked him if he was of gentle birth. I, said he, the son of a knight, but why ask ye? The desire I have, quoth she, to know one thing, which I beseech you by the faith you owe to God and to the king your master, not to hide from me. Who is the lady whom your master loveth best? My master, replied the squire, loves all in general, and none as you mean. While they thus talked, Garinta came nigh, who, seeing Darioletta in conference with Perdion's squire, called her and asked her what he had to say to her. In sooth, my lord, quoth she, he tells me that his master is wont to be alone, and certainly I think he will feel himself embarrassed by your company. Garinta, hearing that, went to King Perdion and said, My lord, I have many affairs to settle, and must rise at the hour of matins, and that you may not be disturbed, you had better be alone in your chamber. King Perion replied, Do as shall seem best to your liking. Then Garinta understood that Darioletta had told him rightly of his guest's inclination, and ordered his bed to be removed from Perion's apartment. These tidings Darioletta carried to her mistress, and they waited the hour when all should retire to sleep. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 How Amadis was begotten and born At night, when all was hushed, Darioletta rose and threw a mantle over her mistress, and they went into the garden. When Elisena came to the chamber door, her whole body trembled, and her voice that she could not speak. King Perion had fallen asleep. He dreamt that someone, he knew not who, entered his chamber by a secret door, who, thrusting a hand between his ribs, took out his heart and threw it into the river. He asked why that cruelty was committed, and was answered, It is nothing, there is another heart left there which I must take from you, though against my will. Then the king suddenly awoke in great fear and blessed himself. At this moment the two damsels had opened the door and were entering. He heard them, and being full of his dream, suspected treason. When he saw a door open behind the hangings, of which he had not known, and leaping from his bed he caught up his sword and shield. "'What is this?' cried Darioletta. The king then knew her, and saw Elisena, his beloved. He dropped his shield and sword, and throwing a mantle about him, which was ready by the bed, he went and embraced her whom he loved." Darioletta then took up the sword in token of his promise and oath, and went into the garden, and Perion remained alone with Elisena, in whom, as he beheld her by the light of the three torches, he thought all the beauty of the world was centred. When it was time that they should part, 
Darioletta returned to the chamber. I know, lady, said she, that heretofore you have been better pleased with me than you are now, but we must go, for time calleth us. Elisena rose. I beseech you, said Perion, do not forget the place. And she departed with the damsel. He remained in his room, and recollecting his dream, which still affrighted him, a wish to know its significance made him desirous to return to his own country, where were many wise men skilful in the solution of such things. Ten days King Perion sojourned at Lima, and every night his beloved mistress visited him. Then it was necessary that he should depart, despite of his own inclination, in the tears of Elisena. He took leave of Garinta and the queen, and having armed himself, when he looked for his sword to gird it on, he missed it. Though the loss grieved him, for it was a tried and goodly weapon, he durst not inquire for it. But making his squire procure him another, he departed straight for his own kingdom. Albeit before his departure, Darioletta came and told him of the great affliction and loneliness in which his lady was left. I commend her to you, my friend, said he, as mine own proper heart. Then taking from his finger a ring of two which he wore, each resembling the other, he bade her carry it to his love. So Elisena remained, leading a solitary life and in great grief. Darioletta comforted her the best she could, and the time passed on, till she felt herself great with the child, and lost the appetite for food and the pleasure of sleep and the fresh color of her countenance. Then was her sorrow and carefulness greater, and not without cause, for in that time was there a law that any woman, of what quality or state soever, offending in such sort, could not excuse herself from death. This so cruel and abominable a custom endured, till the coming of the good King Arthur, who was the best king that ever there reigned. He revoked it at the time when he slew Floyon in battle before the gates of Paris. And albeit, because of the words which Perion swore upon his sword, she was without fault before God, yet she was not before the world, for they had been so secret. To let him know her condition was what she could not think, for he was young and proud of heart, and took no delight elsewhere than where renown was to be gained and so was for ever going on errant night from one place to another. So she found no remedy for her life. Yet did not the loss of life afflict her so much as that of her dear and beloved Lord. But God, by whose permission all this had come to pass for his holy service, gave such discretion to Darioletta that she remedied all. In the palace of King Garinta there was an arched chamber separated from the rest, which overlooked the river. It had a little iron door through which the damsels sometimes were wont to go out by the waterside but now none inhabited the apartment. This chamber, by Darioletta's advice, did Elisena request of her father, as suiting her disposition and solitary life, where she might perform her prayers undisturbed, with no companion but Darioletta, who had always served and accompanied her. This request she lightly obtained, and hereupon was the key of the iron door given to Darioletta, to open when it pleased the princess, to recreate herself by the river. Here was Elisena somewhat comforted to find herself in a place so convenient for her purpose, and she required counsel of her damsel, what should be done with the fruit that she traviled withal. What? replied Darioletta, it must suffer to save you. Holy Mary, then said Elisena, shall I consent to destroy the child of him who I love best in the world? Leave alone those thoughts, the damsel answered. If they kill you, they will not spare the infant. It were great folly to destroy yourself and your lover who could not live after you, for the sake of saving the child, who if you die must die also. As this damsel was of quick mind herself, and now guided by the grace of God, she determined to have the remedy ready before the need, and it was in this guise she took four boards, and with them made an ark large enough to contain a newborn child and its garments, and long enough for the sword. She fastened them together with bitumen, and such sword as the water should have no place to enter. She hid all this under her bed till she had completed it, and it was even and close as if a master had made it. Then she showed it to Elisena, and asked for what she thought it was designed. She answered, I know not. You shall know, said the damsel, when need is. Elisena replied, But little do I care to know what is done or what is said, for I am near to lose all my joy and comfort. Then had Daria let a great grief, and she wept apart, not bearing to see her mistress weep. It was not long before her travail came and in those new and strange pains and bitterness of heart and not daring to cry out or groan it pleased the lord that she was safely delivered of a son the damsel took him in her arms and saw that the boy was a fair boy had he not been born to hard fortune but she delayed not to execute what of necessity had been resolved she wrapped him in rich garments and laying him by his mother brought the ark elisena cried what will you do place him here she answered and launch him down the stream and be like he may escape then the mother took him in her arms and wept bitterly over him, 
but Darioletta took ink and parchment and wrote upon it, This is Amadis, son of a king. It was the name of her saint and of great reverence in that country. She covered the parchment with wax and hung it by a string round the neck of the babe, and Elisena fastened upon the string the ring which King Perion had given her at his departure. Darioletta then placed the infant in the ark and laid his father's sword beside him. This done, she covered the ark, which was securely joined and caulked, and opening the iron door, took it in her arms and placed it in the river, commending it to God. The tide ran strong and soon carried the ark into the sea, which was not more than a half-league distant. Now the dawn appeared, and it pleased God that there was a knight of Scotland sailing on that sea, returning from the lesser Britain to his country, with his wife, who had newly been delivered of a son called Gandaline. The morning was both calm and clear, whereby the knight Gandales saw the ark floating among the waves, and he ordered the mariners to put out a boat and take it up. They speedily overtook it, and Gandales opened the cover, and beholding the babe within, he cried, This is from no mean place. And this he said because of the rich garments, and the ring, and the good sword, and he cursed the mother who had for fear abandoned so fair a child. He carefully laid aside all the things that were contained in the ark, and desired his wife to breed up the infant, and she ordered the nurse of her own child, Gandaline, to suckle him. So they went their way through the sea with a favorable time, and took port in a town in Scotland called Antalya. And from thence departing they came to his castle, which was one of the good ones of the land. There he had the child brought up like his own son, and such he was believed to be, because the mariners who took up the ark had sailed away to other parts. End of chapter 2 Section 2 of Amadis of Gaul by Vasco de Libera, translated by Robert Southey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Book 1 Chapters 3 and 4 of Amadis of Gaul. Book 1, Chapter 3. How King Perdion went to his own country, and of what befell him, and how Udaganda met Don Gandales, and of that which she said to him. King Perdion, having departed from Elima, went his way in great heaviness, as well as for the loneliness wherein he had left Elisena, whom in his heart he loved, as also for the dream which in such a season had come upon him. But having reached his own country, he sent for all his great lords, and ordered the bishops to bring with them the most learned clerks in their parts, to the end they might expound his dream. When his vassals knew of his return, many others, as well as all who were summoned, came with great desire to see him who was beloved of all. The king conferred with them on the state of the realm, but it was always with a sad countenance, whereby they were much afflicted. In this business being dispatched, he dismissed them each to his own lands, only staying with him three clerks, whom he knew were the most skilful in what he desired to learn. These men he took into his chapel, and thereupon his sacred host he made them swear to answer truly what he should demand, without fear, how dangerous soever it were. That done they left the chapel, and he told them his dream. Then one of them, whose name was Ongar the Picard, the most expert of them, thus answered, Dream, sire, are vain things, and for such ought to be esteemed. Notwithstanding, seeing it is your pleasure that some account should be made of yours, give us time to consider thereon. Let it be so, said the king. Take twelve days, and he ordered them to be separated, that they should neither see nor converse with each other. They, to their uttermost, travailed upon this matter, and when the time was elapsed, they went to the king. He first took Alberto of Champagne apart, and said to him, You know what you have sworn, now then speak to me. Sire, answered Alberto, then let the rest be called into your presence, for before them will I tell you. Whereupon they were sent for, and being all met, Alberto began. It appears to me that the closed chamber, and he whom you saw enter by the secret door, signify this realm, which is close and well guarded. Nevertheless, someone shall enter to take it from you, and like as he thrust his hand into your side, and rent forth your heart, and threw it into the river, even so shall town or castle be taken from you and put into his hand from whom you shall not easily recover them. In the other heart, quoth the king, which he said should remain with me, and yet he must take it away against his will. It seemeth by this, answered Alberto, that some other shall invade your country, as the first did, yet constrained more by another commanding him to do so, than by any will in himself. And upon this, sire, I know nothing more to say. The king then commanded Antilles to say what he had discovered. He agreed to all that the other had said, except in this, quoth he, 
that my art shows me it is already done and by the person that most loveth thee this makes me marvel for nothing of your kingdom is yet lost and if it were it could not be by one who loves you so dearly hearing this the king smiled a little for it seemed he had said something but ungan the picard who knew much more than they held down his head and laughed heartily a thing which he had seldom done being by nature a thoughtful and melancholy man the king wondered at this and said now master tell us what you know sire said he peradventure i have seen into things which should be manifested to you alone therefore let these depart then the doors were closed, and they twain remained together. No, king, said he, that what I laughed at was a word of which you thought little. When he said it was already done, and by the person whom best loveth ye, now shall I reveal what you keep closely concealed and think that none knows. Your love, where you have already accomplished your will, and she whom you love is marvellously fair. Then told he all the fashions of her as if she were there before him. The chamber in which you saw yourself enclosed, you well know, and how she to ease your heart in her own entered without your knowledge by the secret door, and the hand that opened your side is your union, and the heart which was taken out showeth that she hath by you a son or a daughter. Master, said the king, what meaneth then the casting thereof into the river? He replied, Seek not to know that which is of no importance. Tell me how be it, quoth Perdion, and fear nothing. Since you are pleased to hear it, answered Ungan, I demand assurance that for anything which I may reveal, you will never hereafter be wroth with her who loveth you so loyally. And Perdion made the promise. Know then, said the master, that what you saw cast into the river is the child which she has had by you. And that other heart that remaineth? What should that be? You may interpret the one by the other, answered Ungan. You will have another son, who will in some manner be taken away against the will of her that caused the loss of the first. "'Strange things hast thou told me,' said Perdion, "'and may it please God that the latter part, the misfortunes of my children, "'prove not as true as what thou hast told me concerning the lady whom I love.' "'The master answered, "'None can alter the things which were ordained by God, nor know wherein they shall end, "'and therefore should neither repine nor rejoice thereat, "'for oftentimes as well the evil as the good proves far otherwise than it seemed. "'And do thou, O king,' lay aside from thy memory all this which thou wast so solicitous to know and pray to god to dispose these things to his holy service the king was satisfied in what he desired and so pleased with the wisdom and the last words of ungan the picard that he rewarded him well and kept him thenceforward near his person as perdion parted from the clerks he met a damsel more ornamented than beautiful who said to him now king perdion that when thou recoverest thy loss, the kingdom of Ireland shall lose its flower. And away she went, so that he could not detain her, and he remained thinking upon these things. The author ceaseth to speak of this, and returneth to the child whom Gandales brought up. He was named the child of the sea, for so they had named him, and with much care was he brought up by that good knight and his wife, and he grew and became so fair that all who saw him marvelled. One day Gandales rode forth, for he was a right good knight and strong, and always accompanied King Languines at such time as they followed arms, and though the king had ceased to follow them, yet Gandales ceased not. He, as he rode along, met a damsel, but thus spake to him, Ah, Gandales, if many great personages knew what I know, they would cut off thy head. Wherefore? quoth he. She replied, Because thou nourishest their death. Now this was the damsel who had prophesied to King Perdion. But Gandales understood not, and he said, damsel i beseech ye for god's sake what is this i shall not tell thee she answered but so it must be and she went her way he remained thoughtful but soon he saw her returning upon her palfrey with all speed and crying with a loud voice gandales help me or i am dead he looked and saw a knight come after her sword in hand and he spurred his horse between them and cried out sir knight god confound thee what wouldst thou with that damsel what said the other wouldst thou protect her who by her art has made me lose body and soul of that i know nothing said gandales but protect her i will for women are not to be thus punished even though they deserve it the knight answered that we shall see and returning his sword into the scabbard he rode to a little thicket wherein there waited a damsel exceedingly fair who gave him a shield and a lance and then he ran at gandales and gandales at him they had not long fought before she who had desired succour of Candiles stepped between them and cried, Hold! Forthwith the knight who had pursued her drew back, and she said to him, Come, make obeisance to me. That shall I do willingly, said he, as to the thing in the world which I most love. 
and throwing the shield from his neck and the sword from his hand, he bent his knees before her, to the wonder of Gandales. Then she bade him tell the damsel under the trees to get her away immediately, or he would take her head off. He turned to her and exclaimed, Thou ill woman, I know not why I spare thee. And the damsel saw that her friend was enchanted, wherefore she mounted her palfrey and rode away, making great sorrow. The other damsel then said, Gandales, I thank you for what you have done. Go, and good be with you. As for this night, I pardon him. That, said Gandales, you may, but I shall not give over the battle unless he confess himself vanquished. She answered, Give it over, for though you were the best knight in the world, I could make him vanquish you. Then tell me, said he, the meaning of what you said, that I nourished the death of many great personages. She made him swear that none should know it from him till she permitted, and then said, I tell thee, he whom thou foundest in the sea shall be the flower of knighthood in his time. He shall cause the strongest to stoop. He shall enterprise and finish with honour that wherein others have failed, and such deeds shall he do as none would think could be begun nor ended by body of man. He shall humble the proud, and cruel of heart shall he be against those who deserve it. And he shall be the knight in the world who most loyally maintains love, and he shall love one answerable to his high prowess. And I tell you that on both sides he is of kingly parentage. Now go thy way, and believe that all this shall come to pass, and if thou discoverest it, there shall happen to thee, therefore, more evil than good. Ah, lady, said Gandales, tell me, for God's sake, where I can find you to talk with you upon this child's affairs. She answered, That shalt thou never know. Tell me then your name. I beseech you by the faith you owe to the thing in the world that you love best. Thou conjurest me so that I will tell, but the thing that I love best is that which least loves me and it is that fair knight which whom you combated, howbeit I cease not for that to bring him to my will, whatever he can do. My name is Utaganda, the unknown. Mark me well, and know me again if you can. And he who first saw her a damsel in her springtime, as one of eighteen years, now beheld her so old and overspent, that he marvelled how she could sit upon her horse, and he crossed himself. She took a perfume-box from her bosom, and touching it, became as she was before. Now, said she, think you to find me hereafter, though you should seek me? Weary not yourself for that, for though all living creatures go about it, if I list, they should lose their labor. As God shall save me, I believe it, lady. But I pray you remember the child who was forsaken of all but myself. Doubt not that, said Udiganda. I love him more than thou canst think, for I shall soon receive aid from him twice, which none else could give me, and he shall receive two gardens to his joy. Now God be with thee, thou shalt see me sooner than thou expectest. And then she took the shield and helmet of her friend to carry them, and Gandales, seeing his head disarmed, thought him the goodliest knight that he ever beheld, and so they parted. As Gandales returned to his castle, he found that other damsel, by the way, sitting beside a fountain and lamenting. She knew him and exclaimed, How is it, knight, that the wicked woman who you helped has not destroyed you? Wicked she is not, said Gandales good and wise, and if you were a knight, I would make you pay dearly for the folly of your words. Ah, the wretch, quoth she, how she knows to beguile every one. She has taken from me the fair knight who would more willingly be mine, but I will be revenged if I can. Gandales answered, It is a wild thought to hope to injure her who knows your very intentions, and as for the knight, it seems to me that you are both without reason or conscience. With that he left her, and came to his castle, and seeing the little boy come running towards him, he took him up in his arms, and lovingly embraced him, and remembering all that Udiganda had told him, he said in his heart, My fair child, God let me live to see thy good days, and with that the tears came. At this time the child was of three years, and his beauty was marvellous to behold, and he, seeing the tears, put up his little hands to wipe them away, whereat Gandales rejoiced as a sign that he would be gentle-hearted and thenceforward he taught him with a kinder will. And when he came to the age of five, he made a bow for him, suited to his strength, and another for his son, Gandalin, and they used to shoot before him. When he was seven years old, King Languines and his queen and household, passing through his kingdom from one town to another, came to the castle of Gandalese, where they were well feasted. But the child of the sea, and Gandalin, and the other children, were removed to the back court, that they might not be seen. It fortuned that the queen was lodged in one of the highest apartments of the castle, and looking from her window she saw the children at play with their bows, and among them she remarked the child of the sea, for his shapeliness and beauty, and he was better clad than his companions, of whom he looked like the lord. 
The queen called to her ladies and damsels, Come and see the fairest creature that ever was seen. While they were looking at him, the child, who was thirsty, laid down his bow and arrows, and went to a water-pipe to drink. A boy, bigger than the rest, took up his bow to shoot with it. This Gandaline would not suffer. The other struck him angrily, and Gandaline cried out, Help me, child of the sea. He, hearing this, ran to him, and snatched the bow, and crying, In an ill minute did you strike my brother? Struck him on the head with all his force. They fought a while till the other was fain to run away, and meeting their tutor, who asked what was the matter, replied that the child of the sea had beat him. The tutor went towards him with the strap in his hand. "'How is this child of the sea?' said he. "'That you dare beat the boys. I shall punish you.' But the child fell upon his knees. "'I had rather you would strike me,' said he, "'than that any one before me should dare to beat my brother.' And the tears came in his eyes. The tutor was moved and told him to do so no more. All this the queen saw, and she wondered why they called him the child of the sea. End of chapter 3 Book 1, chapter 4 How King Languines took with him Amadis, who was called the child of the sea, and Gandaline, the son of Don Gandales. At this time the king and Gandales entered, and the queen asked their host if that fair child was his. He answered, Yes. Why then, said she, is he called the child of the sea? Because he was born on the sea, when I returned from Brittany. "'Truly he is but little like you,' said the queen. And this she said because the child was beautiful to a wonder, and Gandalese was more good than handsome. The king who was looking at him likewise bade Gandalese call him, for I will take him with me,' said he, "'and have him brought up.' "'So let it be,' said Gandalese. "'But he is not yet of an age that he should leave his mother.' Then he went and brought him, and said, "'Child of the sea, will you go with this king, my master?' "'Wherever you bid me,' he replied." and my brother shall go with me. And I, quoth Gandaline, will not stay without him. Gandales then looked at the king. I believe, sire, you must take them both. I am the better pleased, answered the king, in calling Agriez. My son, I would have you love these boys as well as I love their father. When Gandales saw that the child of the sea was placed in the hands of another, the tears came into his eyes, and he said within himself, Fair son, thou art a little one to begin to go into adventure and danger and now I see thee in the service of those who may one day serve thee. God guard thee, and fulfill what the wise Udganda foretold, and let me live to see the great wonders which in arms are promised thee. When the king saw that his eyes were full, he said, I did not think thou had been so foolish. Nor am I, answered Gandales. But if it please you, do you and the queen hear me? The rest then withdrew, and he told them how he had found the child, and he would have told what he knew from Udganda, but for his promise. And now, said he, deal ye with the child as you ought, for as God shall save me by the way in which he came to me, I believe he is of great lineage. Then the queen said, He should be hers so long as he was of age to obey women. And the next morning they departed, taking the children with them. Now I tell you that the queen brought up the child of the sea as carefully as if he had been her own son, and the trouble she took with him was not in vain, for such was his talent and so noble his nature, that better and more quickly than any besides he learned everything. And he was so fond of the chase, that if they would have let him, he would have been always shooting with the bow, or training the dogs. And the queen loved him, so that she would scarce suffer him to be out of her sight. Now King Perdion, after consulting the clerks, abode in his kingdom, and many times he thought upon the words which the damsel had spoken, yet could he not understand them. After some time, he being in his palace, there came a damsel, and gave him a letter from Elisena, his love, whereby she gave him to know that her father was dead, and she was unprotected, and for this cause he should pity her, for the Queen of Scotland, her sister, was coming with her husband to take possession of the land. King Perdion, though he was sorrowful, guaranteed death, yet rejoiced to think that he should go for his mistress, whom he never ceased to love, and he said to the damsel, Return, and tell your lady that without delaying a single day I shall speedily be with her. And the damsel returned joyfully. The king then, collecting a suitable retinue, set forth and journeyed till he came to the lesser Britain, where he found news that Languines was in mastery of all the land, except those towns which her father had left to Elisania. So hearing that she was at a town called Acarte, he went there, and if he was well received, need not be said, and she also by him who so dearly loved her. The king told her to call together all her friends and kindred, for he would take her to wife, 
the which Elisena did with great joy, for in that consisted the end of all her wishes. Now when King Languines knew the coming of King Perdion, and how he would marry Elisena, he summoned all the noblemen of the land, and went with them to meet him. And when the marriage and the feast were concluded, the kings agreed to return into their own dominions. Perdion, returning with Elisena, his wife, came to a riverside, where he would rest the night, and while the tents were erecting, he rode alone along the banks, thinking how he might learn something from Elisena about the child of whom Ungan the Picard had told him. So long went he on in this mood, till he came to a hermitage, and fastening his horse to a tree, he went in to say his prayers. There was an old man within, in the habit of his order, who asked him, Knight, is it true that King Perdion has married the daughter of our king? Yea, verily, answered the king. Praised be God, said the good hermit, for I know certainly that she loved him with all her heart. How know you that? By her own mouth, said he. The king then, thinking to hear of him the thing he most desired to know, made himself known, and besought the hermit to tell him all he had heard of her. Truly, sir, answered the good man, therein should I greatly fault, and you would hold me for a heretic if I should divulge what was said in confession. Suffice what I tell you, that she loves you with true and loyal love. But I would have you know what a damsel, who seemed very wise, said to me at the time when you came first into this country, and I could not understand her that from the lesser Britain should come two dragons, who should hold their sway in Gaul, in their hearts in Great Britain, and from hence they should go to devour the beasts of other countries, and against some they should be so fierce and furious, and against others so gracious and mild, as if they had neither talons nor hearts. The king wondered at this, which he could not understand, but there came a time when he knew the prophecy was true, so he returned to his tents. When they were in bed together, he told the queen what had been interpreted of his dream, and asked her if she had brought forth a son. The queen, hearing him, had so great shame that she wished herself dead, and she altogether denied it, so that at this time the king could not learn what he desired. They continued their journey till they arrived in Gaul, and those of the land were well pleased with their queen, who was a most noble lady, and the king had by her a son and a daughter, whom he called Galior and Melicia. When the boy was two years and a half old, it so was that the king his father sojourned at a town called Bengal, which was near the sea. The king was looking from a window towards the gardens, where the queen and her ladies were solacing themselves, and the child with them, who then began to walk. They saw enter, through a postern door, that went out to the sea, a giant with a huge mace in his hand, so large and mismade, that never man saw him without a fright. The women ran, some among the trees, and others fell down and shut their eyes that they might not see him. But he went straight to the child who was left alone, and taking him in his arms, he laughed and said, The damsel told me true. And with that he went out by the same way, and entering into a bark, put to sea. The queen, who saw him carry away the child, shrieked loudly, but it nothing availed, and her grief was so great that though the king was greatly afflicted for the loss of his son, whom he could not succor, yet... Seeing there was no remedy, he went to console Elisena, who was, as it were, destroying herself with excess of grief, remembering the first son that she had exposed upon the sea, and now that she saw this gone also, she made the greatest raving in the world. But Perdion took her with him to their chamber, and when she was somewhat calmed, he said to her, Now I know that what the wise man told me was true, for this was the last heart. So tell me all the truth, for considering the state in which you were, you ought not to be blamed. And then the queen, though with great shame, related to him all, and he comforted her, and bade her live in hope to hear good tidings of both their sons, whom it had pleased God to take away. This giant who carried away the child was a native of Leonis, and he had two castles in an island, and his name was Gundalak. He was not so wicked as other giants, but of a gentle and good demeanor, except when he was enraged, and then would he do great cruelties. He sailed on till he came to the cape of an island, where there was a hermit. Now the giant had peopled that island with Christians, and ordered arms to be given him for his support. Friend, said he, take this child, whom you must bring up for me, and teach him all that is convenient for a knight, for he is the son of a king and a queen, and I forbid you ever to be his enemy. The good man asked him why he had committed the great cruelty. That I will tell you, said he. I was about to embark to fight with Albadan, the fierce giant who slew my father, and has taken from me the rock Galtares, which is mine. 
But there came a damsel to me, and said, This which you want to do must be accomplished by the son of Perdion of Gaul, who will have more strength and activity than thou hast. I asked her if that was true. That shalt thou see, said she, when two branches of a tree shall be joined, which now are separated. In this manner Galeor was left with the hermit. While these things aforesaid passed, King Philangres reigned in Great Britain, who, dying without children, left a brother named Luzuate, of great goodness in arms and much discretion, who had married Brizena, daughter of the King of Denmark, and she was the fairest lady that was to be found in all the islands of the sea. So after the death of Philangres, the chief men of the land sent for Luzuate to be their king. End of chapters 3 and 4 of Book 1 Section three of Amadis of Gaul by Vasco de Libera, translated by Robert Southey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amy Graymore. Book one, chapters five and six of Amadis of Gaul. Chapter five. How King Lisuarte, sailing towards Great Britain, took port in the kingdom of Scotland, and how the child of the sea was made knight by King Perion without their knowing each other. When King Lisuarte heard this embassage, he set sail with a great fleet, and on their way they put into Scotland, where he was honorably received by King Langulis. Brisena, his wife, was with him, and their daughter, Oriana, born in Denmark, and then about ten years old, the fairest creature that ever was seen, wherefore she was called the one without a peer. And because she suffered much at sea, it was determined to leave her there. Right gladly did King Langulis accept this charge, and his queen said, Believe me, I will take care of her like her own mother. So Lisuarte proceeded, and when he arrived at Great Britain he found those who had disturbed him, as in common cases, and for this cause he did not send for his daughter. And with great trouble that he took he was king at last, and he was the best king that had yet been. Nor was there ever one who better maintained chivalry till King Arthur reigned, who passed in goodness all kings that were before him. The child of the sea was now twelve years old, but in stature and size he seemed fifteen, and he served the queen, but now that Oriana was there, the queen gave her the child of the sea, that he should serve her, and Oriana said that it pleased her, and that word which she said the child kept in his heart, so that he never lost it from his memory, and in all his life he was never weary of serving her, and his heart was surrendered to her, and this love lasted as long as they lasted, for as well as he loved her did she also love him. But the child of the sea, who knew nothing of her love, thought himself presumptuous to have placed his thoughts on her, and dared not to speak to her, and she who loved him in her heart was careful not to speak with him more than with another, but their eyes delighted to reveal to the heart what was the thing on earth that they loved best, and now the time came that he thought he could take arms if he were knighted, and this he greatly desired, thinking that he would do such things that if he lived his mistress should esteem him. With this great desire he went to the king, who was at that time in the garden, and fell upon his knees before him, and said, "'Sire, if it please you, it is time for me to receive knighthood.' "'How, child of the sea,' said Languines, "'are you strong enough to maintain knighthood? "'It is easy to receive, but difficult to maintain. "'And he who would keep it well, so many and so difficult, "'are the things he must achieve, that his heart will often be troubled. "'And if through fear he forsakes what he ought to do, "'better is death to him than life with shame.' "'Not for this,' replied he, "'will I fail to be a knight. "'My heart would not require it, "'if it were not in my will to accomplish what you say. "'And since you have bred me up, "'complete what you ought to do in this. "'If not, I will seek some other who will do it.' "'The king, who feared lest he should do this, replied, "'Child of the sea, I know when this is fitting better than you can know, "'and I promise you to do it, and your arms shall be got ready. "'But to whom do you think to go?' "'To King Perdion, who they say is a good knight "'and has married the sister of your queen. "'I would tell him how I was brought up by her, "'and then he would willingly fulfill my desire.' Now, said the king, be satisfied, it shall be honorably done. And he gave orders that the arms should be made and sent to acquaint Gandales thereof. When Gandales heard this, he greatly rejoiced, and sent a damsel with the sword and the ring and the letter and wax, which he had found in the ark. The child of the sea was with Oriana and the ladies of the palace, discoursing when a page entered, and told him there was a stranger damsel without, who brought presents for him, and would speak with him. When she who loved him heard this, her heart trembled and if any one had been looking at her, they might have seen how she changed. And she told the child of the sea to let the damsel come in, that they might see the presence. Accordingly she entered, and said, Sir, child of the sea, your good friend Gandales salutes you as the man who loves you much, and sends you this sword, and this ring, and this wax, and he begs you will wear this sword while you live for his sake. 
He took the presents and laid the ring and the wax in his lap, while he unrolled the sword from a linen cloth in which it was wrapped, wondering that it should be without a scabbard. Meantime, Ordiana took up the wax and said, I will have this, not thinking that it contained anything. It would have better pleased him if she had taken the ring, which was one of the finest in the world. While he was looking at the sword, the king came in and asked him what he thought of it. It seems a goodly one, sir, said he, but I marvel wherefore it had no scabbard. It is fifteen years, said the king, since it had one, and taking him by the hand he led him apart and said, You would be a knight, and you know not whether of right you should be one. I therefore tell you all that I know concerning you. And with that he told him all that Gandales had communicated. The child of the sea answered, I believe this, for that damsel said, My good friend Gandales had sent her, and I thought she had mistaken, and should have called him my father. But I am nothing displeased herewith, except that I know not my parents, nor they me, for my heart tells me I am well born. And now, sir, it behooves me more to obtain knighthood, that I may win honour and the praise of prowess, since I know not my lineage, and am like one whose kindred are all dead. When the king heard him speak thus, he believed that he would prove a hardy and good knight. As they were thus conversing, a knight came to inform the king that King Perion had arrived. Languines went to welcome him, as one who knew how to do honour to all, and after they had saluted, he asked how it was that he came so unexpectedly. I came to seek for friends, replied Perion, of whom I have more need than ever, for King Abias of Ireland wars upon me, and is now with all his power in my country, and Dagonel, his half-brother, is with him, and both together have collected such a multitude against me, that I stand in need of all my friends and kinsmen, for I have lost many of my people in battle already, and others whom I trusted have failed me. Brother, replied Languines, your misfortunes grieve me not a little, and I shall aid you the best I can. Agriez, who was already knighted, now came and knelt before his father, saying, Sir, I beg a boon. The which being granted, for King Languines loved him as himself, he pursued, I request that I may go to defend the queen my aunt. And I grant it, answered Languines, and you shall be as honorably and well accompanied as may be. This while had the child of the sea been looking earnestly at Perion, not as his father, for of that he knew nothing, but because of his great goodness in arms, of which he had heard the fame, and he desired to be made a knight by his hand, rather than by any man in the world. To attain this purpose, he thought best to entreat the queen, but he found her so sad that he would not speak to her. In going to where Oriana was, he knelt before her, and said, Lady Oriana, could I know by you the cause of the queen's sadness? Oriana's heart leapt at seeing him, whom she most loved before her, and she said to him, Child of the sea, this is the first thing you ever asked of me, and I shall do it with a good will. Our lady, I am neither so bold nor worthy as to ask anything from one like you, but rather to obey what it pleases you to command. What, said she, is your heart so feeble? So feeble that in all things towards you it would fail me, except in serving you like one who is not his own, but yours. Mine, said she, since when? Since it pleased you. How, since it pleased me? Remember, lady. The day whereon your father departed, the queen took me by the hand, and leading me before you, said, I give you this child to be your servant. And you said it pleased you, and from that time I have held and hold myself yours to do your service, yours only, that neither I nor any other while I live can have command over me. That word, said she, you took with a meaning that it did not bear, but I am well pleased that it is so. Then he was overcome with such pleasure that he had no power to answer, and Oriana, who now saw the whole power that she had over him, went to the queen and learned the cause of her sadness, and returning to the child of the sea, told him that it was for the queen her sister, who now was so distressed. He answered, If it pleased you that I were a knight, with your leave I would go and aid the queen her sister. With my leave? And what, without it, would you not then go? No, said he, for without the favor of her whose it is, my heart could not sustain itself in danger. Then Oriana smiled, and said, Since I have gained you, you shall be my knight, and you shall aid the sister of the queen. The child of the sea kissed her hand. The king my master has not yet knighted me, and I had rather it should be done by King Perion at your entreaty. In that, said she, I will do what I can, but we must speak to the princess Mabilia, for her request will avail with her uncle. Mabilia, who loved the child of the sea with pure love, readily agreed. Let him go, said she, to the chapel of my mother, armed at all points, and we and the other damsels will accompany him. And when King Perion is setting off, 
which will be done before daybreak, I will ask to see him, and then will he grant our request, for he is a courteous knight. When the child of the sea heard this, he called Gandalin and said to him, My brother, take all my arms secretly to the queen's chapel, for this knight I think to be knighted, and because it behooves me to depart right soon, I would know if you wish to bear me company. Believe me, quoth Gandalin, never with my will shall I depart from ye. The tears came in the eyes of the child at this, and he kissed him in the face, and said, Do now what I told you. Gandalin laid the arms in the chapel while the queen was at supper, and when the cloths were removed, the child of the sea went there and armed himself all, save his head and his hands, and made his prayers before the altar, beseeching God to grant him success in arms, and in the love which he bore his lady. When the queen had retired, Oriana and Mabilia went with the other damsels to accompany him, and Mabilia sent for Perdion as he was departing. And when he came, she besought him to do what Oriana, the daughter of King Lisuarte, should request. Willingly, said King Perdion, for her father's sake. Then Oriana came before him, and when he saw her, how fair she was, he thought there could not be found more equal in the world. She begged a boon, and it was granted. Then, said she, make this my gentleman knight, and she showed him to Perdion, kneeling before the altar. The king saw how fair he was, and approaching him, said, Would you receive the order of knighthood? I would. In the name of God, then, and may he order it, that it be well bestowed on you, and that you may grow in honor as you have in person. Then putting on the right spur, he said, Now are you a knight, and may receive the sword. The king took the sword, and gave it to him, and the child girded it on. Then, said Perion, according to your manner and appearance, I would have performed the ceremony with more honors, and a trust in God that your fame will prove that so it ought to have been done. Mabilia and Oriana then joyfully kissed the king's hand, and he commending the child of the sea to God, went his way. But he, who was now a knight, took leave of the damsels who had watched with him, and Oriana, whose heart was bursting, though she dissembled that, led him aside, and said, Child of the sea, I judge of you too well to think you are the son of Gandales. If you know anything of this, tell me. So he told all that from King Languines he had heard, and she, greatly rejoicing thereat, commended him to God. He found Gandaline at the palace door, holding his lance and his shield and his horse, and he mounted and went his way, unseen for any, for it was yet night. They rode on till the noon was past, and then refreshed themselves with the food that Gandaline had brought, and when evening came, they heard in the woods the voice as of a man in great suffering, wherefore the knight rode presently that way. He found a knight dead, and hard by him another sorely wounded, and a woman upon him who made him so cry out, for she was thrusting her hands into his wounds. "'Help me, Sir Knight!' he cried, "'and let me not be murdered by this wretch!' The woman at that fled, and the child of the sea alighted, and took the wounded man, whom had swooned away, in his arms, and so dealt with him that he revived, and cried, "'Take me where I may have some help for my soul, for I am slain!' "'Take courage, Sir Knight,' said the child, "'and tell me how this happened.' "'It is that wicked woman,' he replied, "'whom I took to wife, "'and last night she forsook me to go with another, "'whom ye now see lying dead.' and after I had slain him, I told her that I would forgive her, if she would dishonor me no more. But she, seeing how weak I was with the loss of blood, fell upon me, and thrust her hands into the wounds to kill me, so that, well, I perceive I cannot long live. Therefore, I beseech ye, good sir, help me to a hermitage that is near at hand. And they laid him upon Gandaline's horse, and went towards the hermitage. But the woman, who had a little before sent for her three brothers to save her from her husband, met them now whom she had no sooner espied than she exclaimed, Help me, for that wicked knight who goes yonder is carrying away my husband, whom he hath well nigh slain. Follow him and kill him, and the man with him who was as bad as he. This said that her guilt might not be known, and she went on her palfrey to show them the way. The child of the sea by this had left the wounded knight and was proceeding, when they overtook him and cried, Stop, traitor. You lie, replied the child. I am no traitor, and shall defend myself well from treason. Come on like knights. He broke his lance upon the first, whom he drove to the earth, both him and his horse, whence they could neither arise, then took his shield from Gandaline, and so played his part that he lightly discomfited the twain. The woman attempted to fly, but Gandaline stayed her. Then said one of the brethren, We know not, sir, whether this battle hath been for right or wrong, and he then related what his sister had told him. The child blessed himself at hearing this, and told them how she had murdered her husband, and he took them to mercy on condition that they should carry her and her husband to King Languines, and tell the king that a knight who had that day sallied out had sent them to be at his judgment. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 
how Udiganda gave the lance to the child of the sea, and how he delivered King Perion from those who would have slain him. Then the child of the sea gave his shield and helmet to Gandalin and proceeded. They had not ridden far when they saw a damsel coming off a palfrey, and she had in her hand a lance with its belts, and presently another damsel, who came by a different path, joined her, and they both came on communing together. When they reached him, she with the weapon said, Take this lance, sir, and I tell you that within three days it will stand ye in good stead, as therewith ye shall deliver from death the house whence ye are descended. He, wondering at her words, replied, How, damsel, can a house live or die? She answered, So it will be, in this lance I give you for some services, which from you I expect. The first whereof shall be when you shall do an honour to one of your friends, whereby he shall be put into the worst danger that any knight hath been these ten years' space. Damsel, said he, such honour, if God please, I will not do, my friend. She answered, So it will be and spurred her palfrey and departed. Now this was Odiganda the unknown. The other damsel who remained then said to him, Sir knight, I am from a strange land, and if it please you, will abide with you till the third day, and defer my journey to my mistress. Whence are you? said he. From Denmark. And he knew this was truth, for he remembered the language of Odiana in her childhood. Then, said he, if ye please, damsel, to go with me, I will defend ye to my power, but I pray ye, know ye that other damsel? Never till this meeting she told me that Lance was for the best knight in the world, and desired me, after her departure, to tell ye that she bear you great affection, and that her name was Uganda the Unknown. Ah, God, quoth he, how unfortunate I am, and I cannot find her against her will. And thus devising they went until the dark evening overtook them. At this time they met a squire who asked where they were going. Along the road, replied the child. That, quoth he, is true, but if you mean to have lodging, ye must turn aside from it. There is no dwelling place near, except my father's castle, and there shall ye be well entertained. And this the squire did, because far on was a castle, which they could not pass without doing battle, and he had never seen the combat of knight errants. So they were well served that night, and on the morrow, when they departed, the squire said he would bring them again into their way, as far as a castle which they must pass. After riding about three leagues, they saw the castle, and a goodly one it seemed, for before it ran a river, and it had a drawbridge, whereon was a fair tower at the end. The damsel and the squires rode first, but as soon as the damsel attempted to pass, six fellows armed with cuirasses and headpieces seized her bridle, and told her to swear or she would die. "'Swear what?' quoth she. "'Swear never to show favour to your lover till he promised you to help King Abias against King Perion. With that she cried aloud for help, and the child of the sea caught a hatchet from one of the ruffians and felled him. The rest fell upon him. One he sliced to the eyes, another from the shoulder to the ribs. Seeing this, their comrades fled. "'Now, damsel, proceed,' quoth he, and evil be to them that encourage such villainy. But now as they went on, a great noise was heard in the castle, and the damsel told him to take his arms. "'Fear not,' said he. Where ladies are so evil entreated, there can be no men worth anything. Sir, quoth she, I dare not go on unless you take your arms. So he took them and proceeded through the gate of the castle, where they met a squire lamenting out loud. Ah, God, they are killing the best knight in the world for not taking an oath which he cannot keep. The child of the sea passed him and saw King Pideon beset by two knights and ten halberders, who had slain his horse and now assailed him on all sides, crying, Swear or die. "'Traitors,' quoth the child, "'you shall die for him.' With that they called to the porter to shut the castle gate, and half of them, leaving King Perion, fell upon the knight. But soon had he slain the two knights, and rode among the halberders, scattering them, till with the king's help they were all slain, except some few who got upon the walls. But then the child alighted and followed them, and some in their fear leapt down. Two only fled into a chamber, where lay an old knight, so aged, that he could not rise, who cried out, from whom are you flying, villains? From a knight who hath played the devil in your castle, killed both your nephews and all your comrades. The child of the sea had followed them, and bade them show him their master, or he would slay them. And when he saw the old man in bed, he blessed himself, and said, Thou old wretch, art thou on the very edge of the grave, and dost thou maintain such customs? With these words he made offer to smite off his head. Ah, mercy, quoth the old man. 
"'Swear, then,' said the knight, "'that thou, whilst thou livest, no more such treason may be maintained here.' Wheretofore the old man right gladly took his oath. Now tell me, wherefore hast thou heretofore kept this custom? For the love of King Abias of Ireland, who is my nephew, and because I could not aid him with my body, I wish to assist him with such knights errant as pass this way. False villain, quoth the child of the sea. With that he kicked down the bed, and the old man with it, and commending him to all the devils, he left him, and went down into the court, and took the horse of one of the knights whom he had slain, and leading it to King Perion, cried, Mount, sir, for I little like this place and those who are in it. Then they departed. The child of the sea would not take off his helmet, lest the king should know him. And when Perion asked who he was that had succored him in such need, he persisted in concealing himself, till the damsel took his helmet off. Then presently Perion knew him, that it was the youth whom he had knighted at the lady's request, and embracing him, he said, Truly I know now you better than before. Sir, quoth the child, I knew you well, that it was you who gave me the order of knighthood, wherewith so please it God, I shall serve you in your wars in Gaul. They came at length to a double way, and the knight asked Perdion which way he took. The left, answered the king, for it leadeth to my country. God have you then in his keeping, quoth the child, for I must take the right. Then, said Perdion, I pray you remember your promise. So took they leave of each other. The damsel then said to the child of the sea, Sir knight, I have hitherto kept ye company, because the damsel who gave you the lance said she brought it for the best knight in the world, and surely I have seen so much that I know it was a truth. Now I will shape my course towards my lady. And who is she? Oriana, the daughter of King Lisuare. But when he heard his lady named, his heart trembled in such sort that he had nigh fallen from his horse. Gandaline, who saw him totter, ran to him, and he cried, My heart faileth me. The damsel, thinking some sudden sickness was the cause thereof, would have had him unarmed, but he told her it was needless, and that he was liable to such seizures. Then they parted company, the damsel and the squire, towards the court of Languinese, and the child of the sea and Gandaline, going where fortune guided them. Two days they rode without adventure, and on the third, about midday, arrived in the sight of a goodly castle that belonged to Galpano, the most valiant knight in these parts, but who followed the service of the wicked enemy instead of the lords, who had endowed him with strength and courage. He had accustomed to make all ladies and damsels that passed his castle enter in, where forcibly he took his will of them, and made them swear never to take other lovers than him, which, if they refused, he beheaded them, and what knights came he made combat with his two brethren, whom, if they conquered, he would force the conqueror to deal with himself, who was the strongest knight in all that country, and he made them swear to call themselves the conquered by Galpano else he cut off their heads. And when they had sworn, he stripped them of all they had, and sent them away afoot. End of chapter 6